My name is Paul Comrie Thompson. I'm the co-presenter of a program called Counterpoint on ABC Radio National. On behalf of the Sydney Opera House and the St James Ethics Centre, welcome one and all to the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. This session is presented in association with the Centre for Independent Studies. Now, our topic is people with flat-screen TV should stop whinging about capitalism. Now, either there's a lot of people here with plasma screen TVs, or there's a lot of people who want to whinge about capitalism, but anyhow, it's going to be a lively debate. Our two speakers will address the topic, and that'll be followed by a panel discussion and a Q&A. Now, if you wish to comment, there will be people with microphones. Wait for the mic, and then we can have a chat. At the conclusion of the debate, you'll be asked to vote by a show of hands to the proposition that people with flat screen TVs should stop whinging about capitalism. We've been told about mobile phones, so I don't have to mention that again. May I introduce our panel? We have Dr. Oliver Mark Hartwick. He's a research fellow with the economics program at the Centre for Independent Studies. Previously, he was the chief economist at the British think tank Policy Exchange in London. His publications with Policy Exchange mainly dealt with housing and planning, urban regeneration and transport. And before that, I was impressed to find out, he worked as an advisor to Lord Oakshot of Seagrove Bay in the UK House of Lords. Any Tories here? <coughs> Our second speaker is Cassandra uh, Wilkinson. Cassandra works for a large accounting organisation and she provides strategic advice to clients in infrastructure, transport and the public sector. She had a piece in The Australian this week about this, that which was fascinating. She's also founder of Australia's Australian music radio station, FBIFM. And in 2007, she published a book, Don't Panic. Don't Panic. Nearly everything is better than you think, which is a wonderful title. I love it. Uh, and Cassandra also recently addressed the London Battle of Ideas on regulation of the internet... A video of that is on YouTube. Interesting aside there, Cassandra made the point that more kids are endangered by public swimming pools than anything that happens on the internet. She was telling us, I'm really glad I heard that. We must do something about swimming pools. <laughs> <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker addressing the proposition is Dr. Oliver Hartwick. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, back in 1989, it was all so obvious. Socialism had lost, capitalism had won, end of story. When the Berlin Wall was pulled down, it marked the final triumph of liberty over oppression and of capitalism over socialism. The American political scientist Francis Fukuyama even went so far as to proclaim the end of history. Back in 1989, it would not have been a dangerous idea to ask people with flat-screen TVs to stop whinging about capitalism. Not only because nobody actually had a flat-screen TV, <laughs> but simply because capitalism was celebrated rather than frowned upon. But fast forward 20 years. In 2009, socialism has still not recovered from its defeat, nor does anybody really harbor nostalgic feelings towards the Soviet Union. But some intellectuals and political leaders, I'm told, are convinced that capitalism, the great winner of 1989, is now just as bankrupt as socialism was back then. They're convinced that the collapse of Lehman Brothers was to capitalism what the fall of the Berlin Wall was to socialism. The spectacular change in the fortunes of capitalism provokes some obvious questions. Do we have to re-examine the case for socialism? And has capitalism really been thrown on a scrap heap of history? Let's begin with a warning. Instant answers may land you in the Fukuyama trap. Francis Fukuyama was perhaps just a bit too early in declaring the end of history because history didn't care about Fukuyama. <laughs> history continued to be made since 1989. The Gulf War, Rwanda, 9-11, Afghanistan, Iraq, and our personal lives have also changed, and it's not only flat-screen TVs that we have become used to. 
Mobile phones were the size of bricks in 1989. The Internet was still in its infancy. Google had not yet been founded. And when you talked about Twittering, you had birds in mind and not social networking. So history never ends. And for this reason alone, I think we should refrain from delivering premature judgments on the fate of capitalism. It's only safe to say that we are witnessing an economic crisis, which will hopefully come to an end soon. But whether this crisis will bring, bring capitalism to an end is not a foregone conclusion. Having said that, I think that there are great differences indeed between the failure of socialism in 1989 and the crisis of capitalism today. There are good reasons to believe that capitalism will not meet the fate of Soviet communism. Despite all the crises that capitalism has regularly gone through, despite all its woes, troubles, and iniquities, the world has never known a greater wealth-creating machine than capitalism. Where markets were allowed to work, where private property rights were secure, and freedom of contract was guaranteed, capitalism has delivered spectacular increases in prosperity. At the end of the 19th century, Sweden was poorer than Congo is today. The enormous increase in living standards in the Western world would not have been conceivable without the joint forces of capitalism, industrialization, and ultimately the spread of liberty from the feudal few to the democratic many. It was the forces of liberty that propelled unprecedented growth, first in Europe and North America, but increasingly throughout all parts of the world that participated in the market economy. The blessings of capitalism have spread far and wide. Intellectuals often belittle the material progress that capitalism has produced when they reduce it to flat-screen TVs and four-wheel drives, as if Sonys and Hamas were the plagues of modern society. But the least our soy decaf latte drinking intellectuals can do is concede that capitalism has dramatically improved material standards in poorer countries. According to the United Nations, the number of people living in extreme poverty fell by 400 million people between 1990 and 2005. And mind you, this happened while the world's population kept growing. World Bank data show that between 1980 in 2007, global average income per capita increased from $2,762 to just under $10,000. And over the same period, life expectancy rose from 63 to 69 years. The biggest improvements in living standards happened in low-income countries. Over the 20 years from 1985 to 2005, immunization against measles, for example, jumped from 26 to 76% in the world's poorest countries. And where in the year 2000, there were virtually no mobile phone subscriptions in these countries, only seven years later, in 2007, 22% of the population in low-income countries had a mobile phone. It's not bad for an economic order that has allegedly failed. But capitalism has not only produced prosperity, it has spread this prosperity from the few to the many. Imagine a meeting between Louis XIV and Bill Gates, the richest two men of their times. What would impress Louis XIV the most? That Bill Gates could light up a room by the touch of a button. That hot water would flow from his tap. That he could travel around in a car. That he could watch the news on TV, read foreign newspapers on his laptop, and talk to people in faraway places over the phone. Or maybe Louis XIV would be startled by something completely different, namely that all these luxuries are not only enjoyed by the world's richest men, but by virtually everybody in the developed capitalist world. The Sun King would almost certainly feel insulted by this lace majesté, but isn't this democratization of luxury capitalism's greatest achievement? The empirical case for capitalism is overwhelming. Numerous studies have shown how greater economic freedoms go hand in hand with faster growth, greater wealth, better health, and longer lives. Compare this to the practical experiences the world has made with socialism, 
And you shouldn't have any doubt which economic system actually delivers and which doesn't. However, there's not just an empirical, practical argument to be made for capitalism. There's also a philosophical and a moral case to be made. Capitalism simply remains the system best suited to human nature. Like it or not, human beings aren't perfect. We're not angels and saints, but human beings with all our flaws and follies, but more importantly, with our vanity, egotism, and greed. We better accept this before making economic policy. But those intellectuals dreaming of a socialist society, they can never reconcile their theories with this human nature. And no wonder socialists like Karl Marx fantasized about the creation of, quote, the new man, some new species without vices, purged of any bourgeois instinct, free of selfishness, greed, malice, laziness, hate, aggression, envy, or fear. It all sounds too good to be true, and too good to be true it was. I believe an economic system that starts from the assumption that you first have to change man mankind's basic instincts is bound to fail. <clears throat> At best, it will only ruin the economy. At worst, it will kill all dissenters in the process. And from the hallucinations of the new man to the gulag and Auschwitz lies a slippery slope. As we're talking about dangerous ideas today, I think the most dangerous ideas back in Soviet Russia or Nazi Germany was to believe in liberty and human dignity. Capitalism, on the other hand, has never been in the business of changing human nature. It has never indulged in illusions about forming a new man. It is just the kind of system that happens when you let people freely deal with each other. In a sense, we are all born with capitalist instincts. And these instincts have developed in nature. Even our relatives in the animal kingdom know how to play the capitalist game. A study published in Nature magazine discovered that monkeys, yes, monkeys have a sophisticated barter system when uh, food is paid in return for work. The scientists observed that capuchins and chimpanzees, they hunt in groups. But when one monkey makes a capture, it shares the prey with all those who took part in the hunt. The scientists also found that once a monkey had been paid in food, he was much more eager to help out in the future. So here we have all the ingredients of capitalism, cooperation, trade, incentives. It's all there. But don't you call this monkey business. This is monkey capitalism. <laughs> capitalism, in a way, only utilizes what is already within human nature. It takes self-interest and converts it into a greater social good. Adam Smith was right when he observed, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we can expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. And we can even be blunter than Adam Smith dared to be and say it with Gordon Gecko, greed is good. But, and it's a big but, don't exaggerate this greed, or you risk putting the ax to capitalism itself. Our monkey friends also show us what happens if you violate elementary principles of justice. In another experiment with capuchins, scientists from Emory University in Atlanta discovered how monkey capitalism collapses if you don't treat the animals fairly. The monkeys were given tokens that they could exchange for food. But when some of them received food without having to pay for it, the others were so outraged that they went on a riot in the cage the whole social order broke down. So it is not only an instinct for capitalism that we carry with us, but an instinct for fairness, an instinct for justice as well. And if you violate this very system of justice, you are in fact endangering the continuity of the beneficial system of exchange and cooperation. It may not be obvious, but investment bankers and capuchin monkeys have more in common than first meets the eye. And the moral, story of the, the moral of the story is clear. Our business elites are well advised to consider the consequences of their actions for society. They have implications not just for themselves, but for the overall acceptance of capitalism. A bonus payment for a manager whose company just had to be bailed out by the taxpayer may not only be wrong or immoral, 
it is outright dangerous. It undermines society's acceptance of capitalism. There's no use talking around it. 20 years after the end of socialism, capitalism is in crisis. But there's a difference. And the difference between socialism and capitalism is this. Where capitalism produces crises, socialism is a crisis. And where capitalism is built to overcome its crises, socialism's crisis was its ultimate downfall. If capitalists realize that there is more to doing business than just making money, if they learn the lessons of monkey capitalism, then the market economy, this fantastic engine of creating wealth and prosperity, will survive. And it should survive. Because after all, what else should you whinge about when you're watching a French movie on your Japanese flat-screen TV while drinking a good glass of Italian wine? Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Oliver Hart, which you've left us all with a wonderful image of cappuccino monkeys on their mobile phones talking to Bill Gates and say, you remember when Kevin Rudd said, I'm not a socialist? I've never been a socialist. It's a wonderful world, isn't it? Our next speaker addressing the proposition is Cassandra Wilkinson. Hi. Um, I always find that when I have the great privilege to address another group of citizens about things that interest me, that I'm absolutely overcome with terror and horror and, uh, and nerves. And, and I suppose one of the one of the things that is so important about festivals like this and about the empty chair is that it gives us a chance to think about the, the relative risk of free speech um, and the fact that I think generally in, in a country like Australia we're basically all free and rich. Um, we have the opportunity to say whatever the hell we like about pretty much anything we want to um, and it's not a freedom we probably exercise as much as, much as we could while this uh, slightly seems stacked in favour of capitalism to have two speakers on the same topic, I hope that we'll be talking about slightly different things. Um, and I guess I came to capitalism uh, probably through a slightly different path. I've never been much interested in TVs, but I was very interested as a teenager in sex, drugs and rock and roll, um, which might not quite make the connection immediately, but bear with me. Um, and I suppose it seemed to me over the course of my life researching um, one book or article and another that the, the clearest way to make enough money for people to stop starving and start thinking for them to stop drudgery in their labour and start reading and writing and talking and singing and dancing and having festivals and travelling the world and living the kind of life that I would like to live tends to be when they've begun with economic freedom. And the relationship between economic freedom, if you want to call capitalism most broadly the freedom to trade, um, the rules around the freedom to trade have been the ones which have formed the basis of our freedoms to be treated as individuals, to have self-control and ownership and propriety over our bodies, um, over our spirituality, over our ideas. And I think this has been profoundly shown when you see the impact that microfinance and development has in places where people have not had that liberation yet. And the most profound impact of microfinance is not so much that people eat more regularly, which they do, but they begin to do things like take an interest in educating their children, get involved in local politics. Um, you see particularly that mothers get involved in decisions about whether their daughters should be married off. People begin, particularly women, to get involved in things like birth control and local governance. Um, and the liberation that economic freedom brings to personal freedom, you know, there are a million ways to make money in the world, but on this planet, the way that people have most quickly come to personal freedom has begun with economic freedom. And there's all kinds of, you know, books and treaties that have been written on, you know, whether this is about private property and the rules of contracts that are necessary for trade. But one way or the other, capitalism helps us make enough money to stop starving and start thinking. Um, and it also gives us a lot of the tools. But back to my interest in sex, drugs and rock and roll and how that led me down the path to accountancy and economics and other various things, which seem slightly unrelated. Um, I, uh, 
I was a big music fan as a teenager and became transfixed with the idea of pirate radio. Um, when my father and his siblings were kids in the 50s and 60s, the um, Radio Luxembourg was blasting out the sounds of a changing world. It was threatening the ways that their parents were trying to raise them. It was opening their eyes and their minds to a completely different world. Um, and when my friends and I were roaming around Sydney in the 80s, trying to be as free as we could be, um, the connection between music, between rock and roll, between the instinct to, to speak and think exactly the way that you want to um, was quite a powerful one. And um, the journey to establish FBI started back then at that time because Australian music wasn't getting airplay. We had ridiculous government rules around local content, but that was resulting in a few John Farnham records being played over and over and over again, and really nothing much for the bands that I was going to see, that I loved, that I felt were speaking passionately for the experience of my friends and myself. And I think also punk music informed my patriotism. Um, there's probably something not everybody knows is that Brisbane produced the world's first punk record. The Saints, still stranded, brackets on my own, uh, precedes Anarchy in the UK by about three months. And so Australia is actually the birthplace of punk. Um, and that's, you know, that Brisbane, and if you ever get the time to read a book called Pig City, I highly recommend it. The, the intensity of the relationship between punk music and the political journey for freedom that happened in Brisbane is a beautiful case study of the passion that music um, can help inspire people and the communication that it helps engage people with. But those records were produced by little capitalists, anarcho-capitalists, we like to call them at FBI, um, and very much in the way that Andy Warhol had to become an entrepreneur to promote the art that he believed in. Malcolm McLaren had to become an entrepreneur and there's probably some deals that would put uh, Bernie Maddock to shame um, in the McLaren legacy as well. But, um, but the entrepreneurial spirit behind music arose because the, the government um, interest in culture tends not to descend to the level of the popular or profane. Um, and so we decided to do it ourselves and we thought, well, what we need for Australian music is a radio station that feels no compulsion to report to the Australia Council about its quotas. We need a group of people who want to play this stuff because we love it and because we believe that once you have the supply chain sorted out, there'll be an audience ready for this extraordinary music that Australia produces. And 250,000 listeners later, I think FBI has proven that a market-based approach, that a trade-based approach has been the best way to promote Australian culture. It is significant cultural success stories um, in Australian creative history. And I guess the, the interest for me is less these days. At the ripe old age of 37, I tend not to go anywhere near choices of music, and I think there's... Um, there's good reasons that while you probably still can trust people over 30, you shouldn't let them near a playlist most of the time. <laughs> um, but the, the relationship between letting the new rap bands, um, you know, use their bad language and talk about sex on the radio if they want to, and the experience of people around the world who aren't coming to the Writers' Festival, who aren't coming to the Festival of D Dangerous Ideas or any of the other occasions where... Um, <coughs> you know, in, in this very um, humble but important way, we recognise the plight of people who speak freely around the world. It's been... It is in the open societies where people have the opportunity to create commerce between one another and to not rely on the intermediaries of government to decide what you should or shouldn't produce and how you should or shouldn't find an audience or a marketplace for it or share it with others. Um, which is, you know, which is why to me economics, which is written off as the dismal science quite regularly, I think is actually a joyous science. It is really, it's about the study of finding the best possible tools to make people rich enough to start educating their children and make them rich enough to be able to buy books and to exchange ideas and go to festivals like this where we have, you know, the great luxury and pleasure to have the freedom and comfort to do these things. And essentially, um, the relationship between capitalism and freedom, I think it's the other way around. You know, it's, I, don't, I don't particularly love 
capitalism, I love freedom. And capitalism is the system historically that has delivered the most freedom to the most number of people in the most number of communities on this planet. So I recommend it to you. Thank you. <laughs>